But the one term that's allowed at all levels in the university, from the administration all the way on to down to the undergraduates, is he or she is a creationist. And they'll label you with that, and that's the thing that they will dismiss you with. Well, how about you take on this creationist and we will not talk about creation, we will not talk about God, we will just talk about the science. Would you like to go toe to toe, put this word creationist aside, and let's see what you can do. Dr. Tour, I'm so excited to have you on today. And what really made me reach out to you was this moment where you said, I will take down all of my content on my YouTube channel if you, other scientists writing articles and in, in relevant topics can actually answer these questions. And I'm going to give all 10 of you a chance to answer five essential questions that need to be answered for origin of life to be solved. What are these five questions? Well, they're the same five questions that I put up on a recent debate that some YouTubers have said have already been solved. Show me the prebiotic chemistry that would do this coupling. I want to get into that challenge, but I want to back up a little bit first. People who actually value evidence objectively, I don't see how they could look at the work that you're doing and not at least pause and, and, and consider it. Can you tell me essentially what, what, what it is that you're doing? Uh, and, and what is the research that you're doing around origin of life? Can you just give me like a broad overview of what it is? And, and most importantly, because I know we're going to get into the weeds here. Um, what is what is the significance of this? What are the stakes with, with what you're doing here? What I do is I critique origin of life research, but I make molecules for a living. I'm a trained organic chemist, and uh, I've been a professor now for 35 years as a professor. Uh, I make a lot of complex organic molecules, and uh, so I know what molecules do. And, and, and I'm not unique. There's lots of people like me that make molecules. And when you, when you make molecules for a long time, you know what molecules do and what they don't do. And you know what kinds of conditions would allow them to proceed in certain directions. You know what happens to molecules when there's mixtures of them. Uh, it's very different than working with pure compounds when you have mixtures. And so we, we work very hard to get them pure. Biology, on the other hand, is very good at dealing with mixtures because it has selective things that can pick out the molecules it wants. So for example, if you take a, you know, 10 supplements in the morning with your vitamins and you swallow them all within 10 seconds, your body knows what to do with each of those components and it, it has no problem with it. You do that in chemistry, you mix 10 different compounds together and try to do some chemistry, it's a mess. It's just an utter mess. And so it, it doesn't know how to deal with those. So I, I make molecules for a living. I have a very large research group here at Rice University. This allows me to see and to, to analyze and to critique and, and to understand. And so when I don't understand something, I don't think anybody else understands it when it's within the area of organic chemistry. If I can't understand it, and uh, I don't think anybody else can understand it, and and if the, if that person can't explain it to me, they don't understand it either. So that that's a fantastic overview, and that kind of leads into I think the second part of my original question, which is I, I think what I'm getting at with this is like why are you controversial? What what are you? What are, you, what are you getting yourself into that's causing uh, this backlash or this controversy? Can you kind of explain that aspect of things? Yeah, I'm, I'm normally a person that avoids controversy. I just don't like controversy. I'd rather, I'd rather not even speak and walk away and just go on with my life. But for one thing, I became a believer in Jesus Christ at the age of 18. And, and uh, I have read the Bible meditatively, slowly, pensively for 45 years every day. I'm saying every day for 45 years. I read it from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, through Revelation chapter 22, and when I'm done, I start again. And, and uh, so that immediately is going to cause a controversy. Uh, and especially being in a field of science, uh, a lot of people disagree with some of the th feelings that I have and the thoughts that I have, but, but I'm very vocal with that. So that made me, that was controversy number one. Number two then became uh, uh, making comments known about origin of life that I just don't understand it. And, and uh, um, I saw a presentation on carbohydrates uh, a few years, probably five or six years ago, 
And I walked out of there and I had just seen the complexity of carbohydrates, which are sugars, sometimes called saccharides. Saccharides, carbohydrates, sugars, it's all the same word. It's all, all the same <clears throat> material. And so the complexity, and I thought, my goodness, this is, this is so much more complex than what we're led to believe and, and to think that we understand this. So, so I, I thought that I'd, I'd actually it was a, a friend of mine, David Berlinski, said, Jim, why don't you write an article on this uh, of, of how you don't see how these things could have evolved this way? And so as I started looking into it, I started trying to track back evolution to the beginning. And that brought me into the area of origin of life. How did this whole thing start? I didn't even really know what the claims on the table were. And so I asked colleagues and they were, gave me some references and I started to read about this. And I said, this, this can't work. This just doesn't work. This, this chemistry that's being proposed, the chemistry itself screams out that life could not have started this way. And so hmm. I wrote an article on that. And that, that's what kicked the whole thing off. And it's, it's, been, it's, been, uh, it's been a whirlwind ever, ever since. So on that note, I think one thing that I've noticed since I started this channel and have been engaging with people kind of across the aisle and really from like an atheistic, naturalistic perspective is that it seems like very often I find them saying, oh, these people don't even understand evolution. They just don't understand evolution. And I always wonder, is it that, for example, like I recently posted a video actually with Stephen Meyer and uh, Michael Behe and, and a couple other people. And they're, from my perspective, again, I'm not a expert in this by any means, but I'm, I'm listening to it and it sounds like what my understanding of evolution is. But for some reason, I feel like you get this, this um, dismissive, uh, like hand-waving dismissive posture. Like these people are, this is pseudoscience and they just simply don't understand evolution. One of the thoughts that I have is, is uh, that I wanted to ask you is, can you give us a, a basic definition of evolution? And like you said, as you kind of worked backwards down to the origin of life, can you I think what I want to ask, so yeah, definition of evolution, and then how does this this topic of origin of life intersect with that, but kind of the way I see it is almost go beneath it or before it, or I don't know, help, help me out here. So evolution in a, in a very short sense is going from <clears throat> simple to more complex, and uh, going from a simple cell to more complex cell, going from a simple organism to a more complex organism, and the changes that occur from one organism, uh, one change to another that would allow that, studying the details of what would allow that. Uh, that's not actually the topic that I ever really address publicly. Um, but but the, let, let me just get back. I'm, I'm going to come back to your question. I, I just want to touch on something else you said, mm -hmm. because you said that they are dismissive. This is the, this is the excuse to dismiss people. It's very hard, though, for them to dismiss me. They can, they, they'll try to dismiss <clears throat> Stephen Meyer, even though the guy is, is, is frighteningly smart and, and uh, he knows a lot. They'll dismiss him because he's not a real researcher. Uh, uh, they'll dismiss Michael Behe because uh, he just doesn't publish that much. He's not a, not a, a well-published person in the area of the sciences as far as the, some of the people that would like, like to dismiss him. Although he does publish, it's, it's not to the extent that they would like. It's very hard for them to summarily dismiss me because we have, we have analytics. We have ways of measuring impact of people in the sciences, and, that it, and it's... it's I mean, to put it simply, it's something called an H index, which it's not just number of publications, it's not, not, not just how many times people have cited you. It's what is the impact of your work across a large body. And generally, there, there, there's generally everybody who would like to dismiss me, their H index is much, much lower than mine. So it's hard for them to dismiss me. We've published a lot of papers. I've published a lot of papers in my career two, three, four times more papers than anybody who, who would like to dismiss me. So it's hard for them to dismiss me, which makes it a much harder thing for them to ignore me when I'm saying, hey guys, I don't understand this. How about explaining this to me? Let's take it one step at a time. How mm -hmm. would you do this? And so, so now, getting back to your other question, it, the evolution was the from simple to more complex mm -hmm. or simple changing in some ways, some ways deleterious, some ways better, getting eventually to more complex. 
So going from a single cell organism to a human being, that is, that is the two ends of, of, of evolution in a sense. But more fundamentally then is before evolution can even start, you have to have that first cell, which is an entity, which is a, 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 what's called a lipid bilayer. It's, a, it, it's, it's like a, a sac. And inside of that, although the, the sac is extremely complex, so it's not just like a, a burlap bag or something, it's extremely complex. And then you have all the inner workings of that. Nobody has ever made a cell in the laboratory. Nobody has even taken all the components of a cell. So if you just take a, a living cell, you deconstruct it into its fundamental pieces and try to put that thing back together again. Nobody's ever done that. Nobody's ever even come, come close, and nobody even has an idea on how to do it. And every year, that target of making a cell becomes more complex, not because the cell has changed, but because we realize more and more the complexity with that which is, that's in a cell. It used mm -hmm. to be thought that that's just a blob of protoplasm, but it's not that at all. It's a whole hierarchical system of operation of molecules working together. So nobody knows how to even take the basic constituents and put that together. Well, how about making the basic constituents in a way that an early earth would have had to make it? This mm -hmm. gets back to the origin of life. How do you make those basic constituents? Nobody knows. And so the building blocks of the building blocks, people have some certain ideas and it's rough. The chemistry is very, very hard. And uh, uh, they'll use modern techniques and they'll try to insert themselves. They'll use what's called relay synthesis to try to ease the problem. All these things that an early earth never would have been able to deal with. And then once they get these basic raw building blocks of, of say a sugar, an amino acid, and a nucleotide, now you've got to hook those things together. You have to make strings of them. Nobody knows how to do that. Nobody. That's in fact the, the, the basis behind my challenge. Nobody knows how to make those strings. And uh, because you have to make those to get your basic building blocks of a cell. Nobody can even make those yet. And then there's a much bigger inherent problem, which is you need the informational code. It's, it's like if you had a computer, but you had no software. Where is the software that's going to run these things? Nobody understands where the code is that, that encodes this thing. So these are all the problems with origin of life. And I'm just here pointing out the obvious. Truly, I'm pointing out the obvious. It's not like, wow, Jim Tour sees something that nobody else sees. No, I see what everybody else sees. Mm -hmm. every, every other synthetic chemist, every other organic chemist sees every problem that I see. It's just that before I started studying in this area, I took it for granted what these guys said. You know, they would say all sorts of things and, you, you know, you take things for granted because you think they understand. But then when you look in it, you see that this is a house of cards. Mm -hmm. And when I point it out, even my colleagues who are not in this area, they'll, they'll see what I, I have to say. They go, yeah, are, are you the only one saying this? Are you the only one speaking up? And, and you say, well, why don't bunches of people speak up with me? Because they don't want to happen to them what's happened to me because you, you, you undergo a, a, lot of, a lot of attack as a result of this. But uh, as I've said before, I've already thrown my hat into this ring and, and I can't back out now. So th this is interesting because I think that at this point in the conversation is where I anticipate that the, the people are going to start talking about God of the gaps. And uh, that, speaking of this idea of dis, uh, a label that, that allows for dismissal. I think that that phrase is like the ultimate cudgel to simply say, ah, that's just James Tour with good old fashioned God of the gaps yet again. So I, ha I have a few thoughts on this, but I want to hear how would you respond if, for example, we were in a debate here, I'm, I'm playing a little devil's advocate. And I just said, just because we don't understand it yet, you can't fill God into that. It's, you know, it's, you know, it all goes back to Darwin. So how would you respond to that? Okay. Well, first of all, Darwin never touched origin of life. He, he, it was a mystery to him. He, he went from the first cell onward. But, but so I never mentioned God in any of my conversations on origin of life, ever. I never mentioned God. Nor, nor, uh, uh, and, but they always mentioned God. <laughs> where did God come from? 
I've been discussing science. Why, why did you pull out this God card? I didn't touch God. We don't need God to explain this. The science itself screams out, this could not have happened that way. How about we leave God out of the argument? All right, let's leave God out of the argument. I won't mention God. You don't mention God. I just don't understand. Or the other term they'll use is, he, he, he's a creationist. That is the last term that can be used in the university to, to belittle somebody. That's the mm. last term. You, 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 can't, you can't name their religion anymore. You can't say, oh, he's a Jew. Oh, you, you, can't, you can't do that anymore. Uh, you, can't, you can't say, oh, we're, they're, they're just of this of the race, or they're, they're just of that nationality. No, you, you, you'll be canceled for that. But the one term that's allowed at all levels in the university, from the administration all the way on to down to the undergraduates is he or she is a creationist and they'll label you with that and that's the thing that they will dismiss you with they're a creationist or they will say yeah he's speaking or she's speaking god of the gaps you've never mentioned god and mm -hmm. so that's the term that they they continue to use well how about you take on this creationist and we will not talk about creation we will not talk about god we will just talk about the science would you like to go toe to toe and we'll just do that we'll just do that put this word creationist aside and let's see what you can do let's see the damage you can do to this creationist when we're talking pure science you want to go toe to toe and speak to this creationist no they don't want to do that they just want to label as a creationist and run away this is the common way label him as a creationist and run away so this is perfect because this kind of gets right down to the challenge that you've recently put out where you're basically saying put up or shut up. And I love it, I watched another video of you where you said you came locked and loaded. And I, I think that's a perfect that's a perfect phrase to describe what I kind of see in your mentality. You're coming with with something that you want to that you want to show the world. And so can you go into that a little bit and describe uh, what are the the sort of sacred cows that you're that you're coming against? What are the things that you're the big questions that you're asking them to answer that they I, what to me it seems like it is assumed in academia, it is in, in, uh, assumed in the general public that all of these questions have been answered. Here you are saying, answer them. What, what are these questions? Okay, so <laughs> this is, so, so f first of all, the way this happened was a YouTuber started criticizing one of my lectures and it, 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 was, it was elucidating, the, his, his, the name of his video was Elucidating the Agenda of James Tour. So it wasn't merely going after the science. There was no addressing of the science. It was hmm. going after me as a person. And so I came out with a 14-part series to explain origin of life. It took me a long time to put that thing together. And, uh, um, and it, it's... it's, it's not for the faint of heart to try to get through that thing. It's long, it's like 10 hours of videos, and it goes through the science where I try to explain it from the undergraduate level on forward. And, and uh, uh, so, so, so then when I explained it, and so then it's taken off from there. So the challenge is, is instead of addressing YouTubers who just do not understand they just don't understand. They don't have the capability to understand the problems that they're talking about. Say, okay, let me address the PhDs here. Let me address the professors who actually publish in this area. Let me say, okay, you know, I've critiqued some of your work, and, and I've, I've said why this isn't really prebiotically relevant. You changed these conditions. You modified these conditions. You did a relay synthesis where you... You didn't build that up from the beginning. You built a little bit, and then you took from nature, and then you built a little bit, and you took from nature. And so, so it was cheating all the way to say, okay, what are the problems? What would you have to do to solve this problem of life? What would you have to do? <clears throat> so there's four classes of compounds. There's the amino acids, which are, which are uh, the building blocks of your polypeptides or proteins or enzymes, all the same thing. It's, it's, it's hooking amino acids together. Then the next major class is you have the, the nucleic acids. Those are the constituents of DNA and RNA. So you have to polymerize. You have to hook those together to make DNA or RNA. And then 
Uh, uh, then you have the sugars, saccharides or, or carbohydrates, all the same thing. And then you have to hook those together. Those are actually the most complex of all of, all of the three that I've mentioned. Then the fourth class are the lipids. The lipids are <clears throat> what are called sometimes fatty acids. Uh, uh, and these are the, the things, <clears throat> excuse me, that primarily make up the, the, the outer shell of, of a cell. If you had a bacterium, they make up that outer shell, the part of the constituency of that. If you had a eukaryotic cell, which is more of like a human cell, uh, then it makes not just the outer, outer uh, 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 section, but it would say be the outer section also of, of the nucleus and an, another outer section of, say, a mitochondria, whereas a bacterium is, is a little bit more simple. It just has the one, one uh, uh, layer. So, so uh, uh, you have those four classes of compounds. I say, okay, I'll give you the lipids, and I'll give you all the basic building blocks. I'll give you all the amino acids, I'll give you all the sugars, and I'll give you the nucleic acids, which is huge, huge. To give them that is, is an enormous concession that people have spent 50 years trying to make these things and they only can make them very poorly, never as clean as, you, as you're going to need for life. But I'll give you those. Just hook these together. Now, I've asked five questions. Those are not the five questions. Those are five of 5,000 that I could have asked. Hmm. They're, they're really five of 5,000, but they're some of the most basic. And, and, uh, and they're not the hardest questions. There's some of the most basic. They're not the hardest. I have, I have a whole list of other harder questions. And so, so how, would, how would you hook the amino acids together <clears throat> to make the polypeptides, which are these, these molecules that, that are all the proteins and all the, the vast majority of enzymes. Enzymes are the little molecular machines that, that construct us. So, you know, you, you eat ham and eggs this morning and how is that a part of your body this afternoon how did that happen well enzymes broke down those structures and rebuilt them as, as part of your body <clears throat> so uh, uh the second class is if you had nucle nucleic acids which i'll give to you how do you make that into rna because there's a whole hypothesis that has been around since the 1960s called the rna world hypothesis <clears throat> and they have all of these scenarios that rna formed first and what i show on this video is if you happened to somehow get a string of of nucleic acids hooked together which i'm going to ask you to say can you hook these together in the form that is needed to, to act as rna and the answer is no they can't but even if you had that you only have about four hours to deal with it. So in other words, to hook it all together, it had to be totally pure. You couldn't have any other amino acids around. You couldn't have any other of these compounds around. Then it had to plumb. You only have about four hours. So this idea that, that, well, you had billions of years, that's billions of years of trouble, trouble. Because if something happened to form the right way, you've only got four hours. If you had a protein that, that, that happened to form, that was the right, you only have about 13 days and the thing is gone. So that's the that, problem. Can, can we zoom in or can we just highlight that for a second? Because I think that, that that is is very, very important because, and this is something I was going to say a second ago, but as much as people that believe in God are accused of God of the gaps, if you say anything related to complexity, I've been like mulling over this alternative way of, of labeling something, which is like time of the gaps. It's just insert time into any gap and then therefore it explains everything. And it just is like, we might not, we don't know this yet, but there's a future knowledge coming. Just give it enough time and then we'll be able to solve this. And it, it seems to me like a way of sidestepping what we're like what is facing us in terms of the scientific research but what you said i think is even more significant because you're saying that this is not a matter of if you stretch out time longer that that actually solves the core problem here is that is that what is that right because it, these can you just kind of repeat that again or, or highlight that for me you're, you're saying that that it go yeah go ahead go ahead time is your enemy time does not help you it hurts you because the times that you have for the use of these molecules is very, very short. In the case of RNA, which is the primary hypothesis on how life might have started, uh, uh, you have no time. You have no time. You only have hours in order to use this. Hours. 
That's a big, big problem. How, how do people respond to that? Like, what, what, would, what would someone that you're butting up against say in response to that? You know what they say? Nothing. Nothing. They have no response to that. You, you know, you, you'll hear people... Uh, recently, I heard a talk by Jack Sostek in, I think it was 2020, 2021, something. He did a talk at the University of Chicago, and it was a virtual talk during the COVID period. And one of the... Ge- geologist said, you know, we really don't have to have catalysis or anything because we have so much time. And Jack, who's an expert, and he's a Nobel Prize winner, and he's an expert in RNA, he said, actually, we don't have much time. You have to have chemistry that's faster than the degradative chemistry. And so you really don't have much time. But he didn't, he didn't park there and show and, and talk about the extent of how little time you have. You have on the order of hours. If you hmm. make a compound, if I make a compound in my laboratory and I have only a few hours to get it on to the next step, mm-hmm. I am working very, very hard to try mm-hmm. to cool that down, to try to stabilize it, to try to get it on in the next step. Mm-hmm. Hours is a very short amount of time. Now you think on a mindless earlier. So this whole argument of time is absolutely right. It is time of the gaps. They will insert time in their gaps and say time took care of this. And my argument is, no, time doesn't take care of this. Time actually hurts you. So you want to claim this thing of time, it hurts you. So, so yeah, yeah that, that's what we're talking about with that. And then the sugars are the hardest class of mm-hmm. compounds. You think, mm-hmm. oh, sugars are easy. Sugars are the hardest class because sugars have all these different tentacles and, and it can hook up to any one of these points. And if it hooks up to the wrong point, that's the wrong, wrong attachment point. And every disorder, every biological disorder can be traced back to also a disorder within the carbohydrates. So it's really fundamental to get that coupling right. Nobody knows how to do that. Nobody knows. There's people that throw out this idea, well, it's not RNA first, it's metabolism first. All right, you have metabolism. So you get a bunch of little molecules. Now what happens? You just say, now what happens? So so Brandon, what, what they do is they don't confront to address me on this. They just don't answer. People say, well, why don't you publish papers saying that? Well, absolutely I have. I have published five papers in the field. They ignore them. <clears throat> Clemens Reichert, they ignored him. He says you can't have all this human interaction. He published this paper, I think it was 2018, Nature Communications. So they just keep ignoring all of these signs when people throw up roadblocks. And I'm not the first one to point out these problems, not at all. <clears throat> people have, have been writing books about this since the 1980s. Shapiro has been writing books about this. Karn Smith wrote books about this. And they are utterly ignored. So you say, what do people do? And, the, and, and then the, the, the general public is totally clueless on this and misled because the general public surveys have been taken. Two thirds of the general public feels, believes that scientists have created life in the laboratory, Mm. life like single cells. And one third of the general public thinks that scientists have made simple uh, 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 complex organisms like, like, like frogs, small complex organisms like frogs in the lab. We've not even made a cell. We don't even know how to make a cell. And everybody is thrown off on this thing. And this whole idea of the primordial soup model that everybody right. hears about in school, which is molecules were in a pond, there were some lightning strikes, those formed the right sort of molecules that came together that formed a cell, the cells came together and formed uh, these organisms that came out of some pool of water. That is the typical mo- model that is actually not just for fourth graders, that is spoken about even in advanced textbooks in the universities. I'm talking about advanced textbooks mm-hmm. for graduate students in university. That's the extent of the model, and that is fallacious. If you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, send me an email and give me a chance to tell you by Zoom why I believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm glad that you went to that to that broad narrative that that permeates academia because that's where I wanted to go next where you corrected me in that Darwin didn't address origin of life but when you think about sort of maybe it's even a misuse of the term but sort of a Darwinian evolutionary model at least in my mind growing up in school I do associate with that the idea 
of the primordial soup and then out of that you know sort of big bang primordial soup cells and then natural selection taking the ball to the to the to the modern era you know and um i understand what you're saying that darwin actually didn't get into origin of life but what i'm what i'm trying to get at when i talk about that is that narrative that you have all of the complexity that exists today as a byproduct of a primordial soup that existed however many billions of years ago what you're saying is that and and i think this is what i was trying to get at at the start in terms of like what are the stakes like why is this so big what you're doing and i think that it is that it 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 puts a big red x right in the center of that narrative and you're saying there is zero i mean tell me if i'm wrong but there's there's not sufficient evidence i was going to say zero but there's not sufficient evidence to support the claim that life could possibly come from non-life is that is that at the gist of what you're bucking up against here exactly today today and so what I've always maintained is, I don't know what the future is going to have for us, but that if, if, if we can say that life came from non-life, uh, to be able to say that with confidence is, is nowhere close. It's, it's more than 100 years away at the rate that we're going. We are nowhere close to this, and my guess is it's many hundreds of years away before we'd be able to say that with any confidence, that life could come from non-life. And, and uh, yeah, that is part of the problem. I am saying that. I'm saying that openly. And before I was saying it to a YouTuber who sh- surely didn't have the, the ability to understand because he, he would just read the title of a paper, the paper from these very folks that are saying you can do this type of thing. And then when you look at their data, and that's not at all what it showed. So I said, okay, let me go right after the researchers. And I'm, I'm using a social, social medium here. Uh, I'm, I'm using YouTube to call these people out. And mm-hmm. I, I thought it was nice about it. I said, just show me, guys, show me. And to challenge them and give them 60 days to think about this thing. Which we're still in the middle of that window, right? Where, how many days? Well, Where- October 23rd will be the 60th day. So there's, uh, they still have, yeah, they have this time to work on it. Oh, by the way, no, no, none of them have sent me any solutions yet to anything. So, so um, uh, we're, we're about, I don't know, a week, week and a half into this, something like that, or a week into this. So, so um, uh, th- this, is, this is what we're up against, and we're going to show the world that, that uh, you know, the scientists really don't know. I am trying to show the world now that the scientists themselves don't know, and the YouTubers who have said that it's all figured out, and they've thrown up answers as if it's been figured out. I say, go ahead. If you think the YouTuber's answer is right, you take the YouTuber's answers. And I'm letting them critique themselves in other words they can can tell me whether whether it's it's a right answer or not i mean how's that that's like the professor saying okay take this exam and uh you grade the exam and uh uh tell me tell me what what, what grade you got and uh, uh it's just that they can't throw out a bunch of nonsense because now they're responsible to the whole field other faculty will be watching other professors other scientists will be watching and they'll say you call that an answer? I mean, they're, so they're, they're going to have to put out something. Now they're responsible. You know, a YouTuber can throw out whatever he wants. Right. And, and, uh, and he just speaks with authority and everyone's going to believe him. Oh, wow, he's a YouTuber. He must know. No, you, you, can't, you can't play that game in, the, in this field. So they're going to have to come up with a real answer. And, and I put before them five answers. All they've got to do is answer one that's and right. I'll stop talking about origin of life. I'll take down all the content on my website on origin of life, and they can they can just go happily ever after. Just answer one. And you're and, and I, I love the, the uh, it's so audacious. It's so great. I I love I love it. Um, and, and I just want to be clear that your your claim here is not that it's impossible that it will never happen. You're just saying because we can't support the claim that it can happen with evidence, we shouldn't build everything on top of that and we shouldn't only teach a model that has no like not sufficient evidence to support it that's essentially what you're aiming at is that correct you're you're not saying it's impossible you're just saying show me the money and they can't yes that's absolutely right many christians don't understand me in this they write to me oh you 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 think that this can happen and why are you why do you keep saying that you think one day it will be solved or you think it can happen let me, let me be very clear as to why I'm saying this. Because as a scientist, and I am speaking strictly as a scientist, I'm not speaking as a Christian. I am speaking as a scientist. 
A scientist cannot prove the negative on a topic like this. Mm -hmm. There's no way to do it. So, so it would be ridiculous for me to say it can never be solved. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot scientifically prove that point, that it can never be solved. There are some things that you can say thermodynamically, this would, this would violate the laws of thermodynamics. You know, you can say certain things about that. But when it comes to something like this, the origin of life, I don't know how to prove the negative. If you do, using something other than the Bible text so mm -hmm. that it, it's accepted in the scientific world, go ahead and do that. But I cannot do that. And Jim Tour is not going to be your mouthpiece on that. I am just saying that we, we cannot solve this right now. And, and uh, uh, we are so far from solving it that I know it's not going to happen because we've been, it's been 75 years since Miller, 70 or 75 years since Miller Urey, this first experiment where there were, where there were voltage uh, uh, sparks across a, 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 some, some aqueous liquid and you were, were you able to take small molecules like hydrogen cyanide and ammonia and CO2 and, and, and carbon monoxide and, and, uh, and take small gas molecules, whatever they were, and then you can see some small racemic uh, amino acids. And people thought, wow, we're on the verge of really solving this thing. There has been no headway getting us closer to making any of the the, the, uh, 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 the macromolecules that we're, we're going to need for this class. And this is why people think that there have been so many great advances. No, since miller urey there's never been, there's never been a Nobel Prize given on origin of life. And, and so you have all of chemistry, you have all of, of medicine, which is, is, is biology and physiology, uh, each of one, each of those being, being uh, three Nobel Prizes a year. So you got six Nobel Prizes a year for like 70 years. So, so as, that's a lot of Nobel Prizes. None have been granted for origin of life because mm. they really don't solve anything. They really don't solve anything. It's just not there. And the, everybody, everybody who has claimed that they're going to make life in their lab has been wrong. They've missed their deadline. Lee Cronin said that he hopes that he'll have life made in his lab in two years. He said that in 2011. How's it going, Lee? You missed that deadline. Uh, uh, Jack Sostek, Nobel Prize winner. He, he, uh, he said that he'd make life in his lab in three to five years. He said that in, uh, I believe it was 2014 or 2015, in three to five years. He missed that deadline. How's it going, Jack? D uh, Dimitar Seselov, also from Harvard, Jack was at Harvard at the time, uh, said it'd be five years before they'd make life in the lab. Uh, how's it going, Dimitar? Uh, you missed that deadline. And mm -hmm. we're nowhere close. So Jack Sostek has backed way off of that. He said he was overly optimistic. He's working on getting the RNA. He doesn't even have the RNA yet. And even if he had one molecule that had the right the, the, the right form to do something, he's only got hours to work with it. We're so far from this thing, so far, and I'm just going to keep saying it and keep saying it, and if these guys can't answer any one of those five questions, I'm going to keep saying it, and it's going to show the world that they're nowhere close to what they've said. I mean, uh, Steve Benner has said that, you know, with what, all that he has done in this and all that's been done in this area, now we're all set for Darwinian evolution to take over. I mean, Darwinian evolution, you got to have the first cell. Mm -hmm. We're nowhere close to having the first cell. But Steve went out and he told this to the press, and the press takes it up and, uh, and goes with this banner, and, and then it ends up in textbooks. This is the way it's done. And, uh, and I'm just out here crying out that it's wrong. I love it. So, so what, what's the definition of victory for you in all of this? If you, if you had a magic wand and could achieve the purpose that you're aiming at, what would that look like? Uh, the, the, these, these, these academics that, that I've cited in, in, in this video, these top people would say, uh, yeah, Tour's right on this. Tour's right on this. We, we can't answer any of those five questions. All of those five questions would have to be answered to have life. And 5,000 more. We can't answer any of those. And yeah, we're, 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 not, we're not close to getting life. We're, we're not close. Even if we could make all the compounds that we think we need because we can take them from a cell, we wouldn't even know how to put this thing together. So how, how 
on a mindless early earth could have put this thing together. And time doesn't solve my problem. A billion years of letting these molecules stew together won't solve the problem. It just won't solve the problem. You know, this analogy that I use, you take a, you take a pot, you add 10 pounds of, of, of sliced turkey meat, you throw in a few feathers and you boil for a while and you say, eventually a turkey will come gobbling out of there. It's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Not going to happen, and uh, uh, that that would be victory to see a change in a field, and then to see our textbooks change. That on this issue, we don't know where life came from. Scientifically, we do not know where life came from. Well, it's interesting about that, and that gets into a direction I wanted to go as well. Is that it seems to me like you're not only dealing with the purely objective, purely scientific battle, but you're also dealing with about a. a a battle related to institutions and power structures and sort of the official way that things are. And because you're bringing up something that is different than what is in textbooks and what is widely accepted, you also have, I mean, you have a psychology battle to fight in terms of like general acceptance. You also, I think, have, there's something to do with the institutions. I, I don't want to lead this question in any particular direction, but there it does seem to be that there's there's like a momentum that develops where it's like a, it's like a groove that people are used to and to break out of that and to present in a, a different hypothesis just seems like it always really rocks the boat and i think that's something you're really up against also yeah i'm up against consensus i'm up against consensus in science and and i'll tell you brandon there are so many chemists that see exactly what i see mm -hmm. but the ramifications of coming out against this and, 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 and butting against consensus are that you could lose your funding, uh, uh, where they've tried to throttle my funding in many cases. And I, I've been so blessed and so protected by the Lord that uh, uh, the more they come against me, the more I get. I, I, don't, I, don't, I think I'm in, I bring in more money to Rice University in research dollars than anybody else right now. I think if if I'm not number one, I'm number two or three. I mean, of of seven hundred faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so so you know, I've been so blessed in spite of that. You will. It's very hard to get awards uh, uh, because because they'll, you'll get labeled in some ways. I mean, there there'll be there'll be academies that'll say, oh, ninety nine point nine percent of our members uh, 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 buy in wholeheartedly to to uh, a neo Darwin Darwinian model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's because you were self-selecting, because you didn't right. let anybody who was opposed to this in. So it's not like these people were inherently that way. You selected them that way. Why don't you just say you selected those who believe this? That's what you selected. And, uh, and for those that don't buy into it, they would never speak up. Uh, who wants to go through this? And so, yeah, they're, 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 but, you know, some of the greatest advances in science have come from people challenging the status quo. Now, now uh, uh, um, you know, I, I don't know that this is going to have, have, you know, some great profound uh, uh, conclusion here, but we'll mm -hmm. see. We'll see what happens. And uh, um, uh, yeah, vic victory would be to have these, the, these others concede. And, and it's not that we shouldn't stop all origin of life studies. It's that we, maybe we should think about it quite differently. How, how do we go about this? Uh, how do we go about thinking about this? Grand new strategies. And people say, many people have said to me, Tour, you shouldn't criticize others' work until you have your own hypothesis. That's not at all how we do science. Mm -hmm. That is an inaccurate assessment of how science is done. The way we, we even teach it is we teach a mechanism. And if we have evidence that that mechanism cannot work, we shoot down that mechanism before we ever have a solution of, an, of another mechanism. You have to take down the things that are not true right. in order to make way for the things that are true. You don't wait for something else to come along before you shoot down the negative. So, so people who say that again are not scientists. People who are not scientists offer all sorts of advice to me. And, and uh, you know, Christians offer all sorts of advice to me of, of what I should do, what I should say. Uh, they don't know what God wants for their lives, but they know what God wants for Jim <laughs> Tour's life. That's the way I feel. That is, that's really funny. Do, do you have, you, you brought up that, that this is in some sense how, how science has progressed o over the centuries. Do you have any 
I don't know if it's too bold of a, of a thing to associate yourself with, but do you have like heroes, like I'm thinking of Galileo or Copernicus or people who brought about that paradigm shift that you, have you ever used that type of messaging to try to open people's minds and to say like, listen, th- yes, what I'm saying is outside of the consensus, but this is par for the course. We're scientists for goodness sakes. Like, is that, is that something that people are open to considering or is it like back then that was okay, but now we have textbooks. The, the true story behind Galileo mm-hmm. was, for, first of all, he was not tortured by the Catholic Church. He actually, he, he lived quite comfortably in his friends' homes on, on a house arrest. But, but you know, Galileo was, was uh, he, he did kind of open his mouth pretty wide sometimes and say things to people that maybe he shouldn't have said. So in that sense, I relate very much to <laughs> exactly. Galileo, there you, go. you know, and, and, and uh, I've said things that I, I, I shouldn't have said. I, I should have said things more nicely, more quietly. Uh, there, there are things that, you know, like I was in a recent debate and the way I, I lost my cool is, is I'm not at all proud of that. But nonetheless, I posted the video. Mm-hmm. Even though I'm not proud of it, I posted the video and I gave the video to the person that I was debating against, even though I paid totally for that thing to be filmed and for it to be produced. I gave it to him to post. Mm-hmm. Uh, how many people post videos that they're not proud of uh, for everybody to see and critique? And so I have like over 4,000 people that have written to me, generally Christians of of how I never should have lost my cool. I never should have lost my temper. So if you feel that way, uh, you can join the 4,000. I'm not sure that you have more to add over what those 4,000 have told me, but I want you to think about this, that Mm -hmm. I posted the video. Mm -hmm. I posted the video, not because I'm proud of it, because, you know, I feel the Bible posts the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of people. And uh, it, it posts their failures, not just their good. And, and, and for prophets as well, it, it, it posts their failures. I've been reading recently about Abraham, and, it, and you know his failures are right out there for everybody to see. And so those are some of my failures. So, so it's, it's, it's not like I, I, I need more in the community to correct me on this. I, I've really been corrected, even by expert debaters have critiqued me online. So, so maybe you know more than them, but, but I've, I've, been, I've been critiqued on this. So... Um, uh, I forgot your question. We were we were talking about the idea of sort of the official narrative or the consensus view, and I, I was I was just thinking about how in culture in, in this particular cultural moment, it does seem like there is lower trust in institutions than there was, for example, twenty years ago. And I just wonder, with someone like yourself who is doing this. Uh, trailblazing or this, I don't know, you're like, you know, you're, you're going out there, you're letting it rip. And I just, I, I think that those types of references, even though I know you're saying, hey, I'm not, I'm not acting like I'm some big name in science, like I'm the next Copernicus or whatever. But I just think that it is helpful for people to be reminded of that this is literally how science moves forward is, is through that the, the, the the thesis and the antithesis. And um, so I I don't know. I just, I think that, like I said at the start, I think that you are in a unique cultural moment. And I think that there is, um, I I think that it's very timely what what you're saying and when you're saying it, I think is very important. And we've seen it. I, I, the distrust is not just over the last 20 years. It's over the last like three years. Mm. What we were told by, by the experts concerning COVID is is uh, is really alarming, really alarming, and the things that they told us and the things that 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 we were instructed from the so-called experts was, it, it's just sad. It's just sad. And so, yeah, the 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 academy, academia, the scientific establishment has lost a lot of street credibility over the last three years, almost to the point where people are like, wow, if the scientists say it, maybe it's then not true. Maybe it's therefore not true. Uh, uh, and, and so much of the cover-up um, uh, of, of, of what went on and, and, and the things that have been told. So, so yeah, I've, I, I think that, that that's an example where there were a few standing up and saying that, that, that no, that this, is, this is not right. Um, and... and yeah, it, it's just it's just sad all the credibility that's been lost, and and we deserved it. The scientific community deserved it. But I do I do think that it opens a, a little crack in, in the in the wall, if you will, for 
for, I think, people like yourself, who, like you said, are outside of the consensus view. And I, I do think that um, there's collateral damage to this as well. But the idea of, of lay people trying to look into things and trying to get to the bottom of things and to know the truth and to kind of do your own research, which I know has now become a meme. But I, I do think that there, although there is collateral damage to that, I do think that there's something good about that for people not just to blindly accept what is told to them through the television or whatever the case may be, but to really actually try to look at multiple sources, to look at things with an open mind, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, I think in in that type of a milieu, there I see you, you know, sort of raising raising a different banner. And uh, I just think it's interesting. I, I think I think like I like I said at the start, I think that um, people who are willing to look at this with an open mind and people who actually value evidence, not 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 just evidence that's convenient, but people who actually value evidence objectively, I don't see how they could look at the work that you're doing and not at least pause and 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 consider it. I I think that that's that's the case, and and you know the other thing, Brandon from. As you know, I post on my YouTube channel, Dr. James Tour. I post a lot of science topics. I post a lot of faith-based topics. Uh, you know, I, I teach a weekly Bible study to students, as I've done for for twenty-five years now. Uh, the same Bible study I, I, I teach students, and um, uh, so what what's happened is a lot of people who watch that on my YouTube channel, who we're really drawn away from God because of claims that science made throughout their educational experience, throughout high school and college. They were drawn away from God because they felt science was teaching away from God. They write to me, they say, you know, after watching your videos, I've returned to the Lord. I've returned to the Lord. And a lot of people have written me these things, and Mm -hmm. it's encouraged them a lot in their faith. And so I'm glad for that. Because, because scientists say things that are so not true. You know, there has never, I, I have never seen discord between a scientific fact and something that's said in the Bible. There's, lo- there's lots of discord between scientific theories and things that are said in the Bible. But mm. theories come and go. Theories change all the time. Certainly on the order of decades, theories change. And, and theories have changed a lot around Darwinism uh, mm-hmm. uh, over the last three or four decades, a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, we can go into that if you want. But, but uh, uh, so science and their theories change all the time. So what I try to get scientists to do is say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Is that a fact or is that a theory? Is that a fact or is that a theory? And uh, um, so, you know, it, it, the, the, the main reason to encourage me in this whole process is that people are coming back to faith. People are seeing that, hey, you, you know, the claims that scientists had made are not the end-all, be-all. And, uh, and so, so for that, it, it, it makes me happy. But I only, when I'm speaking on origin of life, I'm only dealing with science. So to say, ah, there he is, he's throwing God into this. No, 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 no. I use mm-hmm. science, but I say the science itself testifies that this Mm -hmm. could not be how life formed. Mm -hmm. This could not have been the way because it's too complex to have ever gone by this way on a mindless early earth. Because even with all your insight, Mm -hmm. you can't get it to happen. Even with your modern laboratory, even with all the controls in place in your modern laboratory, you can't make these compounds. And then even if you could, you couldn't assemble the cell. And even if you could, you have no idea where the information came from. I mean, there's articles that are written, purely scientific articles that say the same questions we were asking about for the origin of information 50 years ago, we will be asking 50 years from now because it is an enigma. We have no idea where the informational code came from. That's the problem. You're reminding me of a little bit here of what you're saying of G.K. Chesterton when he talks about um, the idea that a Christian is able to be a complete thinker in a way that it, that's not available to others. And he, he suggests that you don't start with God and then work out into all of these different disciplines, but that you can actually start uh, just looking objectively at science, for example, and follow that road down where it leads and 
and it takes it starts pointing you in a certain direction but then separately come into look and look at for example morality or human dignity or beauty or and, and you and you look at all of these different uh pieces together and together they make a cumulative case where there's a cohesiveness to it they all directionally point towards the reality of god and then you realize looking at it in reverse that they all well if that's true then they all actually flow from god they're all you know it, it would be it would make sense that things would be coherent and that thing and that it, it would be possible to be a complete thinker if that if it were true that there was actually a source creator behind everything who gave people dignity because they're in his image and who gave people minds capable of perceiving the insane complexity that exists in the natural universe it would make sense that all of these pieces would fit together if there was an organizer behind all of this organization and i, I just i love how chesterton puts that and what, what you're saying is just look at just look at the science and and uh but to me i view your insane specialization in this for me it's like this one beautiful thread but still just one thread in a tapestry though that fits in with all of these other disciplines and specialties that other people have in philosophy and moral and, and morality all these things work together to, to begin to create the whole picture thank you so much thank you and th thank you for for giving me a voice here and and if i could just point out my youtube channel is dr james tour so you go to youtube just type that in and you'll you'll get on over to my channel and and uh check out some of the things that are there if you're enjoying this series give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button and that way you'll hear when we're coming out with new videos there are no salaried employees in this organization all the accounting all the legal work that's all done by friends of mine the only thing that i have to pay for is the production work and if you could help us out with that i'd appreciate it there's a link below where you can just click on that and help us in several different ways thank you